Today we're talking about The Prophecy, book number 34. This is another Rachel book, and it's ghost written by Melinda Metz. The last book we got from her was number 29, The Sickness, which I gave a rather disappointing 5 out of 10. Okay? So not going to on into this one with many big hopes, considering as well that books 32 and 33, especially 33, were so magnificently disappointing. I did not go into this one with good hopes, especially, especially considering that a lot of people consider this one filler. So everything going into this goes against this book, but how does it fare? Firstly, let's go over the ghostwriter. Just like in book 29, I thought the characters were pretty much on form. I don't think there's much that can be said wrong about the character interactions, how the characters are portrayed. In fact, I think she does a magnificent job with these characters, so there's no problem on the character personality front. The style of writing is fine. One of the big problems with 29 was the pacing, especially in the middle of the book. This one... <sighs> It was all right when it came to pacing. There are a few bits where I thought it felt a bit strange, but for the most part, I think it's much better pacing than number 29, The Sickness. So we're off to a good start with this one. Now let's go into the plot. So we start off with a scene where Cassie has decided to take Rachel to go to her teacher's house and steal an exam or test that she submitted that had a love letter to Jake, like a little love heart sort of thing. Firstly, of course you'd take Rachel, because Rachel's the only one that ever goes on these impulsive missions, and she is toxic when it comes to this sort of stuff, so... That's fair, that's totally in character, I don't know why they're still doing it. It seems like a pretty meaningless mission, and until you get much later on in the book, this thing seems entirely pointless. I mean... The whole Jake-Cassie relationship doesn't really play into this book, so this first scene seems a bit... Why is this happening? And I think I get it later on in the book, but as of now, this seems completely irrelevant. Cassie is flying home. She's in Almorf. It's late at night. There's not much going on. And she gets back to the barn and she sees a hawk bajir. Now she goes into attack thinking that this, of course, is a controller. She wonders why. Why is this one on its own? Turns out it's Jarahami and she swerves aside just in time. And she says, nice night for a walk, isn't it, Jarahami, you dick? <laughs> But Jarahami brings news. Apparently there is an Arn who has come to visit the valley. So the animals gather and they fly to the Hawkbridgeir Valley, which we haven't seen for a while. It's been... Book 23 was the last time we saw the Hawkbridgeir Valley. So it's been quite a while. The Hawkbridgeir have been doing their own little thing and they've rescued a few more Hawkbridgeir. At least that's what we can gather from this point. But they go there and of course there is this Arn there. And he's stolen a Yerk ship. So the animals are thinking, why is this guy here? What's going on? Toby says, we wanted you to come here because we, could thought, we thought we could do with your opinion regarding this, and especially regarding Axe. What the Arn has come for. He says that he wants to take DNA samples from the Hawkbajir Free Connolly, which he heard about from Yerk transmission interceptions and what have you. He wants to create a clone army, essentially, and take them back to the Hawkbajir homeworld to restart the resistance. Now, this all seems rather fishy. Why? Why, why, why? Firstly, the Arn is the last one, and he's old, apparently, and he hasn't got long to live. So the Arn have nothing to gain from this. What do the Hawkbajir have to gain from this? Well, you'd think, considering that the planet was completely taken over by the Yerks, there isn't much that they can gain. But the Arn says that he wants to give the Hawk Bajir a chance of revenge. We never really establish whether he is genuine in this. We never figure that out, which is strange. Of course, the Hawk Bajir agree to this. Most of them just agree with it because Toby agreed to it and they like the idea of continuing the fight on their own homeworld, which is fair enough. But mostly because Toby agrees to it. Now, the Arn has a a, uh, what's, what's it called? The Arn has a wild card. Wild, I can't speak today. The Arn has a wild card, and that is what's called an Ixilla. That is a little vial, 
that has Aldria's brain in it. Not technically the brain, but her thoughts, her memories from when she created the Ixilla. And he says, we can find a weapons cache, but we need Aldria to help us find it because she would be the only one who would have any clue where this thing is. So the animals agree to host Aldria. We remember Aldria from the Horbagir Chronicles. At first, they're thinking that Rachel or Toby are most likely to receive Aldria because the Arn explains that the Ixilla is most attracted to the person who is most like or most recept, recept, rece oh, fuck it. Well, that, that word that I can't say. Most thing to Aldria's personality. So they think Rachel or Toby who are fierce and proud and, and all that sort of stuff which seems logical at first. They take, the Hortbegir take the animals and the arm to a cave where they can do this ghostly paranormal thing and they continue to do it there. Now, let's take a stop here. What happened in the last book? We got a very religious little bit, the Utsum. Let's, for the most part, I just want to forget that the illusion book 33 exists but it had this religious sort of side to it towards the end where there's this utsum and it's this, oh, spiritual fucking thingamajigger. And I thought that's strange and religious. Now the Arn comes along and their speciality is biology. This isn't biology. This is fucking witchcraft shit. And it's almost religious again. We've got her life essence in this vial and we'll have this... Ouija board like sort of thing. I think even Marco jokes about a Ouija board or Tobias, one of those two jokes about a Ouija board. And it's almost this religious ceremony that brings Aldria back to life. And I thought it very strange. And it's funny that the last two books have both had this almost religious element. Very strange. I don't know what Catherine and Michael think about religion, whether they're religious, whether they're not religious, but I don't know. We're starting to get a religious theme going on in Animorphs and pff, I don't really like it that much because it's sci-fi and religion doesn't really belong in sci-fi, but we'll just play along with it for now. Turns out Aldred doesn't pick Rachel or Toby. She picks Cassie. Now there's confusion as to why she picks Cassie. And even we as the audience would think, why would she choose Cassie? If you read the Hawk Bajir Chronicles, she's not very much like Cassie. She is quite fierce. She is quite forward and straight and... She will do things, not necessarily for the greater good, but she will put aside sentimental things for a, a big military tactic sort of thing. And she chooses Cassie and there's a whole scene where she's trying to get into Cassie's brain and all that sort of stuff. And I thought it was very well described. Now, in the midst of all this going on, there's a, a brilliant bit of interaction here on page 28. Axe shifted his weight from one hoof to the other. I ask only because it is a logical question, he finally said. I did not mean to sound suspicious of my Andalite friend, Toby said with no sincerity whatsoever. The Horpagir have reason to be hesitant about trusting the Andalites, Axe allowed. Toby bowed her head graciously. Then she said, I too want an answer, Arn, etc, etc. It's foretelling of what's to happen a lot in this book. There is a lot of underlying tension here and I think it's really well written. All this underlying tension between the various characters. It's amazing how you throw one character, Aldra, into the mix of all this. And suddenly it's this, this is thing underneath it all. This tension. Mostly between Axe and Aldria. But also between Aldria and the Animorphs. And then the Animorphs and Axe. And there's this... It's, it's really well written. But it, yeah, it's mostly between Aldria and Axe. Because Axe doesn't like the fact that Aldria turned herself into a Hawkbridgean Nofflet deliberately. Aldria doesn't like Axe because, as she says in the book, I know how Andalites are. There's a reason I betrayed the Andalites and turned myself into a Hawkbegir. And it's really, really well played, really interesting, and I really enjoyed it. And I also love Toby Hammy. She is fantastic. She, <laughs> she doesn't get enough in this book, personally, and she hasn't had enough in the series to this point, but every time she's there, she's, you know she's there. These little digs at Axe 
just those little things that she's thrown in, the whole bit of she's saying it, stuff with no sincerity. It's like she is she's a hawk bajir, isn't she? And the hawk bajir have a natural distrust of the Andalites for what they did. So we know that Toby is a seer and she, she thinks more straightforward and she sees through things, but she still holds that little bit of resentment towards the Andalites. And it's a juicy little bit of resentment and I love it. And Toby Hammy, brilliant character. I just, I just wish we had more of her. So now Aldra is in Cassie's head. And the way it's described a lot, but basically throughout this book, is that there's a wall between their minds. So they share this body and Aldrich sometimes is able to force Cassie to do things and vice versa. It's not like a yerk, it's not. Cassie still has most of the control over her own body, but she can allow Aldrich to talk. But there's this wall in Cassie's mind which Aldrich is behind and sometimes her emotions and her feelings slip through this wall, but sometimes she can build that wall and just completely close her off, herself off from Cassie. And... It sounds bizarre at first and a bit metaphorical, but I think it really works here. I think Melinda Metz really pulls it off. And we get a really interesting scene where Aldria first comes to consciousness and Cassie and the other animals are starting to talk to her. And they explain to her that she is dead. And this is, of course, a shock to her. And she hears that the arm's there and she's like, what have you done to me? What's, what's going on? She finds out she's in this human body. And then she also learns that the hawk lost. Because we've got to remember that this isn't Aldria the moment she died. This is Aldria when she made the Ixilla before, she lived life after this particular break. Oh, for God's sake, fiance. This is her frozen in a moment in time. She had more stuff do going on after this that she has no memory of. So she is frozen in a specific part of time. And now she comes into Cassie. And she's learning all this stuff for the first time. She's learning that Dak Hammy and Ciro Hammy, which is her son, are dead. Now, I don't know about you, but that must be quite a shock. And not one that you're going to get over quickly. Especially Ciro Hammy. Because they, Toby explains to Aldria that Ciro Hammy, her beloved son was taken as a controller and he died in yurt captivity. Now, I don't have kids. I don't. I don't know what it feels like to have a child and to worry about them and to love them and not want anything bad to happen to them. But for Alger to hear that, you can only, I, I can only imagine and probably not do a very good job of it, the pain that that would bring. We never know Ciro Hammy. We, we'd never met him before. We've only heard of him. But Melinda Metz does a great job of making him an emotional tool to be used in this book. Now, at first, I thought she'd done a pretty bad job of it. Because at first, it almost seemed like Aldria learnt about Ciro Hammy and she had this moment of, oh, my son, my son suffered this horrible life. And then she just forgot about him. That just the grief was done. It felt like that at first. He's dead of not living anymore. <laughs> oh. oh, hold me from us! Oh, fuck it, he's acting. <laughs> Wake me up when he's finished. <laughs> what thunderbolt of happenstance is this? I mean, alack the day, cry for shame. Howl ye winds, snap ye twigs. <laughs> Great Uncle Peregrine, gone. <clears throat> oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, didn't leave me any money. But to be fair to this book, as it went on, Ciro Hammy became much more prominent in Aldria's thoughts. And it really did feel like she was grieving this fate worse than death for her son. And it's awful. It is absolutely awful. And Aldria, despite this, still managed to, to go ahead with what needed to be done. She was a very strong character in this, despite all that was thrown to her. She's dead. She's been told, you're dead. Your husband is dead. Your son is dead. And now we're just using you to find something on the home planet, which was destroyed and you lost. But there is one hope that she has, and that is Toby Hammy. She's introduced to Toby Hammy. 
her great granddaughter. And that gives Alja just that little bit of hope that allows her to bring herself back together and carry on to for this mission. And we know why she's going ahead with this. We know why she does the thing that she does. It's Toby. And it's implied throughout this book, very subtly, but it's very much implied that the only reason she goes ahead with doing any of this is because she sees Toby and she thinks, I see myself in her, I see Dak in her, and that is my hope. I may not exist anymore, I may be just temporary now in this dead existence, but I will do what I can for her. And it's brilliant. It really is brilliant. Melinda Metz, fucking great job on this. So Alger and Cassie get to know each other a little bit and they spend time in each other's head. Rachel teaches Alger about Cassie's morphs and they're all still a bit iffy about this whole thing because they don't want to lose Cassie because the whole thing here is that Alger could just decide not to leave and she could take over Cassie. Now the animals are obviously very paranoid about this. So they agree to go to the Hawkbegir planet with the Arn, whose name is, I forgot his name by the way, it's Quaffiginivon. So Quaffiginivon says, we're gonna go there. The animal's like, we are, not go we are not gonna stay behind if Cassie is going. Whether she's a receptacle for this Ixilla or not, we're going because we will not just abandon Cassie like that. We want to make sure that she stays. So that's the plan. One other thing as well that I found strange was Toby goes along. Why? Why does Topi go along? Is there any need? Not really. The animals, fair play to Jake. He says, this isn't really necessarily about us. We're only gonna get involved in this because Cassie is the receptacle. If it weren't that, we're out. It's not our, it's not our war. But Toby has agreed for this to happen. There is no reason now for Toby to go to the Hawkbridge planet. There really isn't if you think about it. There is absolutely no need. And as we get to the end of this book, the last chapter, we find out why the plot required Toby to be there. But that's, that's the big downside of this book, that there was no reason for her to go, why do it? You could say it was her decision, but that was never really, as from what I remember, Toby at no point said, I will go to the Hawkbridge planet with you. It's just, she never said that. Again, another reason why I think we needed more Toby Ham in this book to make that plot, that thread of plot, more convincing. We didn't get that, unfortunately. So they go back to the Hawkbegir Valley later on once they have a discussion with the Chi, because yes, the fucking Chi are there again. Thankfully, they don't f do fuck all this time. They're just impersonating the animals while they're gone. So they arrange that with the Chi, and then they head back to the Hawkbegir Valley, and they are going to set off to the Hawkbegir planet. They acquire Hawkbegir where they can, so Cassie acquires Jara, Jara Hammy. One thing I've just noticed as well, so we never get an interaction between Aldria and Jara because Jara is her grandson. We never see them interact. Again, it would have been, it would have, even if it's just a little line here or there. It, when Cassie's acquiring Jara's DNA, Aldria didn't say to him, my grandson, I hope you're well, or whatever. No, it's... It's one of the great letdowns of this book and it needed, it needed to be 20 pages or lot so longer to throw these little bits in which just would, would have made it feel more real. But whatever. They get on board this stolen Yerk ship that Quaffiginivon has taken and they're going to head back to the homeworld. And as soon as they get on, the banter erupts amongst the crew. And it's mostly between Aldra and Axe again and they're falling out. So we're on pages 66 and 67. Axe went over to the controls. This is a newer generation Yerk ship. They've made some small innovations since they acquired the original Andalite technology from... Well, we all know who gave the Yerks the capacity for Z-space travel. So he's just having a little dig at Aldria. What? You're a bit being a bit of a dick there, Axe, let's be fair. My father, Aldria answered defiantly. My father, Prince Ciro. Without my father, the Yerks would never have the opportunity to spread their evil. Without my father, we would not be all be risking our lives on this mission. That is the point the Andalite wishes to make. Whew, it's getting spicy in here. What he did is not so different from giving these humans the power to morph. And who did that, Aximilias is still? I know they could not have developed the technology on their own. You cannot compare your father to my brother, Axe began to protest. And they carry on like this. And it's, it's a really nice little interaction. And then fucking Jake steps in. Get in, son. 
You know, Algier, Tobias began to say. Okay, discussion over, Jake said. Tobias fell silent in mid-word. Mid I could feel Algier's incredulity at being silenced by what she saw as an alien youth. We have a team here, Jake said in a voice so quiet it forced everyone to lean forward to listen. We have to be able to count on each other. And he carries on. For Jake, you are back, son. The last, I think, three books, Jake has been off form. He's back, baby. And it's not just this scene. Throughout this book, Jake is just in charge. He's got, an, he's got Aldria there, who doesn't care for this human, but he still holds that leadership ability, and he holds it throughout this book. And it is brilliant, Jake. Brilliant. Love it. But that page 68 is a, a strange thing that happens, which I think was a bit, a slightly bit out of character. Meaning that you are in charge, Aldry demanded, almost laughing. That's exactly what I mean, Jake said. I felt Aldry's emotional reaction, a mix of resentment, condescension and worry. Jake has led us through more missions, more battles than you and Dak ever fought, I said, annoyed at her attitude. Cassie, how the fuck would you know that? And how dare you? Come to this person who we know died fighting the Yerks and just assume that you've had more battles and you can put her in, the, in her place by that. You, person who died fighting a hopeless war, I have had more battles than you, even though I've only been doing this for a year. No, Cassie, fuck off. How, how dare you say that to Aldria? Let's... let's... But she's got no reason to believe that either. She, nobody's ever told her she fought... 27 battles and we've fought, what, 33? No. For all Cassie knows, Aldra's fought hundreds. She doesn't know that. She just assumes, oh, we've fought more battles than you. How dare you question Jake? <laughs> so then they fly off into space. They go through Z space. So there's the Animorphs, Quaffaginivon and Toby and Cassie slash Aldra. And they come to the outskirts of the hawk atmosphere and they find an Andalite ship. Now, because they're on a Yerk ship, the Andalite ship starts to fire on them. And the animals and the rest wonder what they should do. And there's a very interesting little scene. Axe, can we outmaneuver him? Yes or no? Jake asked. No, Prince Jake, we cannot. But I cannot. Jake ignored his answer. Aldria? She knew what he was asking. I felt her ambivalence, her hesitation. Yes or no? Jake snapped. Yes, she said. She seized control of my body again, pushed off from the ceiling and floated weightlessly in beside Axe. Cripple him if you can. If not, Jake said. Prince Jake, we cannot, Axe pleaded. My decision, Axe man, Jake said gently. Aldra, it's your show. Oh, Jake, you're... Oh, ooh, my, my boy, Jake. I, this... You are awesome. Just Jake, Jake is back. Jake is back now and he's back with a vengeance. That, just that decision making. Axe, please Jake, don't, don't fucking shut up Axe. This is my choice. I'm the leader. We will do as I say. Yes, Jake. Love it, man. Good. Strong leadership. The Andalite ship fires on them and hits them and they're slightly disabled. What happens then? The Andalite pilot decides to just hover there, very slowly moving forward. So the Andalites, the Animorphs have time to think, oh, what should we do? I think we should disable the engines. Let's just calmly and peacefully head to the weapon station, take aim and fire. Bang. Andalite ship damaged. Well done, team. What a fucking incompetent this Andalite pilot is. Let, let me just slowly move towards them and hope they don't fire on me. <laughs> what a cock. And then the, there are four Yerk ships that come up and they're just as bloody incompetent. Are, are all fighter pilots in this series complete incompetence? They're just walking into danger. Fucking, I, I don't give a shit. If they kill me, fuck it. <laughs> I'll be out of a job, but eh. get on the dole, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, what, what fucking incompetence these fighter pilots are. It, it just makes it seem a bit too easy. It's a bit shit, really. So they land on the Hawkbeard planet and they descend below where the mist would have been. The mist from the Hawkbeard Chronicles where all the monsters lived. They descend below that and to where the Arn used to live. And it's mostly destroyed, but the animals still see it as this rather beautiful place. 
and they're walking down these steps and there's a genuine laugh. I had a genuine laugh and I don't get those much in Animorphs. Because let's face it, it's not a comedy. Sometimes I get a little tee-hee, but this was a genuine, oh, that's quite funny. <laughs> and it was this bit on page 94. So it's like a volcano down there with lava and everything, Marco said, talking about the core of the planet that's below them. How hot is that lava, you know, in case we fall in? You're not helping, I told him, without raising my eyes from my feet. Really not. You do not have to worry about the lava, Cassie, Axe comforted me. Thanks, Axe, I answered. If you fell, I believe you would be incinerated before you hit the actual magma, he continued. I thought, F <laughs> I like that. I had a genuine laugh out of that. And that's not... Melinda Max, thank you for the laughter. So Quaffa Ginevon takes them into this laboratory where they have these big massive vials where he's going to grow these Hawk Bajir clones. And he gets busy to work, so he's going to get straight on with that. And the animals are going to be left to find this weapons cache. And there's this strange bit, because you remember, I didn't talk about this, but at the start of the book, they established that Aldria didn't actually technically know where the weapons were. She had a vague idea of where she might keep them. So we come on to page 97. I did not know the location of the weapons. I remember Dak and I had, and the others, the few still gab with us, taking the ship. But I must have hidden them after recording my Exilla. You don't know where they are, Cassie accused. Nonsense. Oh my God, you don't. I can feel it. I can tell you're lying. Cassie. Remember at the start of this book where we established that she didn't technically know where they are? She's not... <laughs> Cassie! Have you got short memory? We know that she doesn't really know where they are. We're just going on inkling, basically. On rough estimates. So why is Cassie now kicking off? You don't know exactly where they are. You're lying. I'm telling. <laughs> Cassie, just chill. We already knew that shit. Why are you getting so fucking wound up? But that comes to nothing. So they go off and they start searching for the weapons. And they're looking around for clues and they all morph Hawk Bajir. And it's a really nice scene. I'm sorry if I put a little red, I've got hay fever and I've just had a sneezing fit. But let's carry on. Aldria and Cassie, Aldria slash Cassie, morph Hawk Bajir with the rest of them. And we have a scene where they're just jumping through the, t through the trees and they're having a whale of a time. And we, we learn a bit here and there about Hawk Bajir and how they do. And, and everyone's having fun just bouncing through the trees, just gaily flying through and bouncing off branches and doing somersaults and what have you. And at one point, Aldra sees Toby Hammy smiling and laughing and, and enjoying herself. And it's just a nice little moment of levity, really. And I really appreciated that. But then Tobias, who's the only one not in Hawk Bajir morph, just watching from above, says, we've got trouble ahead. Just going to take a moment here to point out a couple of strange things. So page, they both occur on page 104. Uh, the mother sky is referred to as father sky, which I just imagine is a typo. I mean, we've seen enough typos to know that they do happen on occasion. And from page 103, Jake says, lead the way. He's morphed Hawk Bajir, but... Aldria notes, obviously preferring to use thought speak rather than struggle with the difficult Hawk Bajir diction. And for the, at first, she's using the Hawk Bajir voice because obviously she's used to it and she likes talking like that. But then for a couple of pages, specifically 104, 105, she reverts to thought speak as well. But then later on, she changes back to normal. So, yeah, page 104 or 105, I think the editors were just taking a break. <laughs> I don't know. They find a massive yurt pool where Aldria's home used to be. She'd had a memory at some point. I forgot, I forgot where exactly in the book it was, but she had a, a dream or a nightmare, more like, where she she's in her home tree and Dax there and he's telling her that he loves her and she says it back and it's really rather sweet. And Ciro Hammy is asleep in a little nest and it's a really nice family scene. And then it just develops into this nightmare where Ciro is saying, you can't help me, mother. You can't save me. I'm taken by the Yurks and whatever. And Dak disappears and, and what have you. But that's their tree. Aldria wants to go back to that tree. 
she wants to see what's happened to it but it turns out that entire area of trees has basically been cleared and turned into a massive yerk pool once again just another blow to Aldria and she manages to muscle her way through it but she has that moment of just pure grief as to what has happened but the, she, Tobias sees something on one of these felled trees that's holding this yerk sludge water in and it's a symbol so it's a carving out of the bark and they've carved like little intertwining branches onto it and it's got the initials A and D or what would be translated to the initials A and D, I suppose. Apparently it's a hawk bajir sign of undying love, which is, yet again, let's throw some more hawk bajir lore in there. They have certain symbologies. I mean, up to this point, we didn't know that they had these abstract ideas. In fact, even in... Hawk Bajir Chronicles, it was sort of implied that they didn't have these, but apparently they do. I'm not sure if that's a contradiction or whether it's just, you know, we didn't say that that stuff didn't happen. It was just sort of implied that they didn't do much abstract thought. But yeah, the, the Hawk Bajir have these undying love symbols, which is rather sweet. And Dak and Aldria did one on this tree. And Aldria says, that's where I would have put it, inside that tree where that little symbol is. So the animals hatch a plan and it's obviously it's a completely insane animals plan as animal as Marco would surely say and I think he did. The plan is that Cassie Morph's bird of prey flies really high above the yerk pool and then morphs demorphs and morphs whale so that she can get into the... Because the, the entrance, according to Aldre, will be on the water side of this tree. So it'll be underwater. So she's going to morph well. And all the Animorphs are going to be bugs on the inside of her mouth. And they're going to demorph and then remorph inside her mouth. And she's going to fall into the water. <laughs> it's, a, it's... Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous plan. But fair play to Melinda... The way she wrote it, it was almost believable. Almost. But there was one thing that really irked me. One thing. And I think this is a Melinda Metz thing, by the way. So she's fallen from the sky. She's demorphing from Bird of Prey. And she's falling. But she's maintaining her wings so that she gets some air resistance and she falls quite slowly. But at the same time, she's morphing whale. You heard me right. She's demorphing and morphing at the same time. Where have we seen this before? Nowhere, ever. This is just a new thing that Cassie is suddenly able to do. Remember the last time Melinda Metz wrote a book, it was 29 The Sickness, and Cassie, Cassie just knew how to do brain surgery. <laughs> Not only can she do brain surgery at the age of 13 with no prior training, she can also defy the laws of morphing without prior training and she just does it when she needs to it's really weird it's really weird and it's not like Aldrew was helping her Aldrew's in the back of Cassie's head like I can't believe we're doing this this is crazy this is impossible this is impossible but no Cassie's just like yeah I'm just I'm yeah I'm demorphing and morphing at the same time what the fuck of it <laughs> that's probably the worst part of this book it's just like what? Well, how was this? Where's this come from? What's this? But, whatever. <laughs> but she falls into the water. The other animorphs demorph inside her mouth and then remorph. And then she'll jump out of the water just in time for them to fly out of her mouth and cause a distraction. So Marco's in Hawkbajir morph and he's warning all the other Hawkbajir. Oh, the, and the Andalites are everywhere, spread. And the Yerks, for the most part, do that. But there are taxons in the water. Jake and... Rachel, I believe, are hammerhead sharks and they just get rid of the taxons, which gives Cassie slash Aldrich enough time to do what they need to do, which is find this slot, this opening in the tree, pull it open and whew, they get sucked in with some of the water. And inside there is the Yerk ship. Not the, yeah, it was a Yerk ship, so the weapons catch. I mean, we get another sweet moment where the password that Aldrich uses is Mother Loves Zero. And everything powers on and they get inside the ship. And uh, we could have done without this, really. We just get a, a healthy fistful of cringe 
thrust into our faces. We burn our way out. Once we create a hole, the water will rush in and through. If we cr it will create a vast drain that will empty much of the pool and suck many of the yurks to their doom. Yes, Aldria said. Do you object, brother Andalite? No, sister Hawkbegeer, I do not. Then power up the drake on beams. It just feels so forced. All throughout this book, they've been throwing little stinging lines at each other. And they, they, they clearly don't like each other because, you know, the whole Hawkbegeer Andalite thing. And I don't think that little brother Andalite, sister Hawkbegeer thing, it just sort of felt like, where did that come from? Usually for those moments, there needs to be like some sort of major self-sacrifice and doing something for the other. But they've just done this mission. They haven't particularly helped each other out in any way. And then suddenly they're like, they're bezies. They're like, fucking, yeah, I fucking, remember that time where I fucking hated you? <laughs> it just felt cringe. It, it was cringe Hollywood stuff. And I didn't appreciate it. I preferred it when they were fighting. It felt, it felt more real. Them just suddenly being like, oh, all is forgiven. It was just, it was too, it was quick, undeserved, and yeah, quite frankly, cringe. <laughs> but either way, they escape and loads of Yerks die. They, they suspect maybe 10,000 or so Yerks perish. And of course, the, the animals are a bit sort of awkward about this. Uh, we just killed 10,000 Yerks. I mean, I mean, I know that's in the grand scheme of things probably good for us but at the same time we feel a bit shit and Aldria she questions Cassie and she says why are you so upset about this and Cassie says uh, basically she says we've learnt a lot and we don't like it when we have to take lives no matter what those lives are and I thought that was necessary because if that moment didn't happen then I'd be rather frustrated because we have learnt a lot since book six where Jake killed those yurks in that yurk pool we have learnt a lot, and so that felt right being put in there. Nice one, Melinda Metz. And then that's practically in the book, so they've got this weapons cache, and we just assume that Quaffaginivon gathers that, and that he flies them all home. But of course, we've got to deal with the Aldria inside Cassie problem. And they do deal with it in one of the least convincing ways possible. <laughs> so Aldria and Cassie... My fiance's buzzing me again. She's buzzing. She's still buzzing. There she goes. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Women! Aldrin and Cassie have a really nice moment where they're saying, it's been an honour to be sharing a body with you. And it felt... It felt really good. I mean, I know the whole bit between Axe and Aldrin was a bit cringe at the end there, but this felt a bit more deserved because they have shared that body and they've shared their emotions to some degree on and off. And Aldria knows that she's got nothing left to live for, but this, that she's done something for her great granddaughter. But remember at the start of this book where I mentioned that it seemed weird that Toby was going? It only seemed to be for this moment because they were saying, oh, it was Axe that suggested it, actually, for whatever reason. Toby will be here to stay with the Hawk Bajir on this planet and deal with them. And Aldra's like, no, her place is down on Earth. I don't know why she says that, but all the animals suddenly agree. And Axe changes his mind as well, because he's the one that <laughs> takes Toby hostage. Yes. So... Aldria puts up this little game of, oh, I'm keeping Cassie's body. So Axe comes up behind Toby and threatens to slice a fucking throat so that Aldria has to leave. And then Toby has no choice. But So to Aldria's left. So Toby is there. And she has no choice in the matter anymore. I don't... It's, it's one of the big letdowns of this book. The end just seems so rushed and so unconvincing. And not only that, but how is Toby going to feel about that? You know, she's she's their ally and she's followed them along the way and she's been loyal to them and, and whatever. And then suddenly Axe is like, I, I will kill you if this person doesn't do what I want to do. She must be feeling like, who the fuck? What crowd have I fallen into here? Fucking cutthroat, fucking twazzocks. <laughs> 
Yeah, and we never got a reaction from that. We never got it. We were deprived of a Toby reaction to being taken hostage and her life being threatened. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's one of those letdowns. And do the animal, because the animals have been saying throughout, oh, this is the Hawkbridge's choice. This is their war. We're only here because of Cassie. And then suddenly they decide, well, Toby's coming with us. It's our choice that she comes with us. We have to threaten her life so that she comes with us. It just seems a bit mixed messages much. Also, what happened to the Ixilla? We know that Aldria's essence would go back into this vial. Does Quaffaginivon keep it? I, I imagine he does and he just keeps it there and then the cloned Hawkbidgeer take it. Also, just going back quickly. So t I imagine, I can only imagine that Toby would have also given her DNA to Quaffaginivon for him to clone. Why would she have needed to stay in the Hawkbidgeer planet? if there would have been a clone of her there, so that there could have been essentially two Tobies, one on the Hawkbridge planet and one on planet Earth. That makes more sense. So he wouldn't have had to go through the whole, oh, I'm gonna cut your throat, Toby, if Aldry doesn't leave. It just seemed a bit nonsensical, nonsensical. And it's a real letdown as well, because apart from that and a couple of other scenes, this book is fan it's fantastic, fantastic. Now, before I forget, I mentioned the first chapter of this book where you had the love letter. So Cassie submitted a test and she had a little symbol of, I love Jake on it. Now, they go into this house at the start of the book, this other person's house where they don't, you know, they've never been there before. And they're seeking a love symbol, a symbol of love, and they have to take it. That is a parallel to what happens on the Hawkbridge homeworld. They're on this strange new planet. And what they're eventually looking for is a symbol of love. And that's what they find. For the life of me, I can't think of what the deeper meaning is there. It just, it doesn't seem like there's a deeper meaning. It's just a, that's the same as that thing and there you have it. Maybe there's something deeper there, but that's why that first scene is there, I think, because it basically, it's basically the same thing that happens on the Hawkbridge own world, except they're looking for someone else's love letter. What do we make of this book overall? Fantastic really is a treat, especially after the disasters that were 32 and 33. I went into this book with low expectations, and I think most people would. And do you know why? Do you know why this book has such a, a poor reputation amongst the Anwos fans? One reason, because people see it as filler. Now, what is filler? Something that doesn't add anything to the storyline, adds nothing to the lore, and if it were removed, nothing would change. Is that true of this book? To some degree, to some degree, because the events that happen in this book do not come up again in the rest of the series. Spoiler alert, we never hear about the, Hawk, the new Hawkbajir resistance back on the home planet. But we also need to look at a couple of other things, don't we? We need to be honest with ourselves here. That is an addition to the law. Regardless of whether we see it again, there is an established second resistance on the Hawkbajir home planet. Even though we never see them again, we know that they're out there. We know that they probably played a part off out in the Animos universe. But not only that, think back to the Hawkbajir Chronicles. What were some of the major unanswered questions of that book? I asked it, when I made the video and I put the title on. Does she love him? She loves him, she loves him not. Did Aldria really fall for Dak or was it an action out of necessity? Did she truly feel betrayed by the Andalites or did she take the only action she thought she could to keep herself alive? Those were questions that we didn't necessarily get the answer to. I don't think we got the answer to at all in the Hawkbajir Chronicles. They're answered here. Undoubtedly, does she love Dak? According to this book, absolutely yes. We have that answer now. Whether it came over time or it genuinely was love in the Hawkbridge Chronicles, we know now they were most definitely in love. They had a child together. They loved each other. They loved Ciro Hamming. And she felt betrayed by the Andalites. So we get those answers that we didn't receive in the Hawkbridge Chronicles. So in that sense, it is not filler. This ultimately falls down to you, whether you believe it's filler or not, whether 
a new faction elsewhere in space that we never see again necessarily in the main series, whether you consider that to be filler. But let's face it, it's not the separation, which if you just removed the separation from existence in the series, who's going to know the difference? Probably nobody, ever. If you remove this book from existence, you're removing an entire faction. Whether we see them again or not, you've removed a faction from the overall Animorphs universe. So, make of it what you will. What do I give this book in terms of scores? Let's cover Jake first. Jake's leadership. I thought he was brilliant throughout the majority of this book. The plan at the end seems a bit strange. That he's going to drop a point or two for that. But I think overall, he was in charge despite having Aldria, who didn't trust him, Thrust, thrust into the team. He managed it perfectly. Perfectly. I'm going to give Jake an 8 out of 10 for this. So what about the book itself? We've just come off of The Separation and the Illusion, books 32 and 33, which were both horrendous disappointments. So obviously this one, in comparison, is going to feel like the best book in the series. It's not. No way is it the best book in the series. But God damn, it's fantastic. It really, this is an underrated book by the fan base. Most people say it's filler, you know, it's not that great. But I'm of the opposite opinion. I think this thing is fantastic. It really is. The, the way it's written, the characters, the, the emotion that you get out of it, the sheer emotion, the stuff with Aldrich thinking about Dak and Ciro is heartbreaking. You can only imagine what Aldra is going through knowing what's happened to her husband, and especially her son. The problem for this book is that it's let down by certain small moments. The Axe Aldria cringe at the end of the book. The rushed, unconvincing ending. It needed 20 more pages or so just to cover all those little gaps or those little rushed bits. It needed that. If it had that, it would no doubt be a 10 out of 10. But it's not. It's a 9 out of 10. It's a high, a very high 9 out of 10. It's sort of equal footing with The Warning, Book 16, The Warning, which are both, so they're both, yeah, high 9 out of 10. Close to 10, but not quite there. A few little moments let it down. But yeah, seriously, underrated book. Whether it's filler or not, it's entirely down to you. I'm not going to come up with a conclusion here. Personally, if I were to say, I would say it's not filler. I would say it's not because it answers questions to what is regarded as one of the best books in the series and it establishes a new faction. So it's to me, it's not filler, but you might have a different opinion and I understand why. I understand why you'd have that different opinion, but otherwise, brilliant. Really, really sh surprisingly good book. What's next, you may wonder? Well, it's this one. The Proposal, book 35, and I can't even remember reading this one. I did, I just can't remember. It was so long ago, so I think it's all going to be a bit of a shock to me. If you like talking animals, I've got the Animals Discord. That's linked in the description below, as well as fan fiction, but that's going through a big edit at the moment, so I'm not strongly ad advertising that. And I will be doing audiobooks for them in the future. By the way, I will be, well, a lot of the stuff in here will not be filler if you take my fan fiction into account. Spoiler alert. I've got plans for my fan fiction and some of the a few books down the line, this will no longer be considered filler if you take my fan fiction as an extension of the series. Just saying. Plays a part in it. So keep an eye on that. Edits coming up soon, audio books if you prefer that. Thank you very much for watching. It's been great again. Thank you kindly, and I shall see you next time. Ta-ra.